Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's session in the Edgewa United Synagogue Adult Education Programme. Usually, when I construct the biennial programme of talks, lectures and films, I anticipate little will change between then and the date of the event many months later. In the case of tonight's session, I couldn't have been more wrong. I anticipated a historical approach to the roots of the Middle East conflict with little content, content about the present. On October the 2nd, Jake Sullivan, President Biden's National Security Advisor, wrote in the Foreign Affairs magazine, although the Middle East remains beset with perennial challenges, the region is quieter than it has been for many for decades. He wrote that in the face of serious frictions, we have de-escalated crises in Gaza. I don't think anyone could have anticipated how this assertion would be turned upside down within five days. As a result, Oren Kester, our guest speaker tonight, has changed the title of his lecture from Palestine 1936, The Great Revolt and the Roots of the Middle East Conflict, to Terror and Jewish Resistance Then and Now, and has changed the content of his presentation to talking about the horrendous attack on October the 7th and everything since, and then only towards the end will he tie it into his, the book. He says that he has the feeling that's what the audience will be thinking about, and it's certainly what he's been thinking and reading about non-stop. He will leave time for Q&A, so please be ready with your questions and comments. A brief word about our speaker. He has served as Deputy Director for Research at the Foundation of, for Defence of Democracies. He was Arab Affairs Spokesman for the Jerusalem Post, translator and writer for the English edition of Haaretz, and a research fellow for the London-based Henry Jackson Society Think Tank. As a journalist and political analyst, he is currently based in Tel Aviv, and his Palestine 1936 book was published in February of this year. Okay, I, that, that, that sounds like that's that's my cue. Thank you uh, so much, Spencer. Uh, thank you to all of you for 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 tuning in. Uh, thank you also to Richard Cohen for helping helping this come together. Uh, let me set my timer here to make sure I don't run over. Um, uh, a quick correction there, Spencer. It's the theme is terror and Jewish resilience rather than resistance, and I think that's a very important uh, important theme in these in these very difficult times. Um, so again, it's 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 lovely to be with you, uh, even in these very difficult circumstances. This is my very first UK event, believe it or not. The book came out in February in the US and in April in the UK, but this is my very first UK event after I don't, after probably dozens here uh, in the US where I'm, where I'm currently visiting. Um, I was going, as Spencer mentioned, the original topic of this talk was, uh, was my book, Palestine 1936. Uh, but I think given what has happened, it would have been unfair to you. Uh, and I myself wouldn't have felt right if I did not talk about what has happened over the last three weeks. Uh, it's, uh, it's certainly what I've been consumed with emotionally, intellectually, personally, uh, and I'm sure many, most of you as well. Uh, so I'm going to talk, as Spencer mentioned, quite a bit about the present and then lead into the past and how uh, history can can inform the, the context of what's what's happening today. And, and I do want to leave ample time for q and I'm sure uh, that many of you have questions and comments and emotions and thoughts that, that you'd like to uh, to share with with the rest of us. So I'm going to I think I'm going to start with sort of a, my own personal experience of that day. I I I, uh, I believe Spencer mentioned, but but perhaps not. I do live in Tel Aviv. I'm based in Tel Aviv. Um, uh, it just so happens I was I was in the U.S. on October seventh. Uh, but I'll I will begin by talking about my personal experience of that day, and then sort of zoom out to a more analytical perspective, and then and then finally bring my my book in. So October seventh, twenty twenty three was my wedding day. Uh, my my partner and I. Clara had come, we had come to New York City uh, about two weeks before the wedding in order to iron out all of the details. We had planned a lovely, intimate 
wedding with just our two immediate families, a rabbi and a photographer in one of those gazebos in, in Central Park in New York. And, uh, you know, my my um, my partner, I should say my 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 wife now, Clara, she's quite old school. She's quite old fashioned in, in many ways. And so the night before she made clear a few days ahead of the wedding that we would not be spending the night before the wedding together, but rather I would be in our newlywed suite and she would be with her family at a hotel in New Jersey. Uh, and that's how it was going to be. So the morning of October 7th, I awoke at a hotel in Midtown Manhattan. I awoke to the ring of my cell phone and I saw that I was getting a call uh, with the with the country code on it, the, a call from India. And I thought, well, that's odd. I had done a few media hits on Indian uh, TV over the years, but um, it was slightly unusual that they'd be calling me at that hour. And so, of course, I, by this point, I was half awake and I was groggily looking at my phone and I started to see the news alerts coming in. And I saw 40 Israelis killed in Hamas attack in, in, in southern Israel. And I said out loud, what the bleep what on earth 40 israelis i'm sure many of you recall the horrific uh, park hotel massacre of the second intifada the passover massacre in 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 natanya interestingly also on a, on a jewish holiday it was a horrific awful day in which 30 israelis were massacred uh, and it also prompted a major IDF response in the form of Operation Defensive Shield. This is a this is an attack we still talk about to this day quite often. Well, 30 people were killed in the Park Hotel massacre. And now I'm getting an alert that 40 Israelis have been killed in 2023 when Gaza is supposedly quiet. And so I'm I start to read the articles and I'm trying to understand what's happened. Is this you know, was this, was it, did, what did rockets strike a, a football game and everyone was exposed and it was just, how on earth did this happen? And I'm reading and I'm reading and I'm still not quite understanding what happened. And mind you, this is about eight, nine o'clock AM on the East coast of the U S. So this is about eight, nine hours after the attack. And I still cannot understand what's happened. So finally I go to Twitter and I click on images and that's, when I began to understand what happened, because I saw images of uh, seven bodies uh, lying on the ground face down in Sterot at a bus stop in Sterot. I saw video of young people at a desert party running for their lives as shots ring out behind them. I saw a young woman who we now know is named Noah Al-Gamani, one of those festival goers. Uh, we, I saw her being forcibly placed on a, on, on a motorcycle by bearded men with, with bandanas as she screams out, don't kill me. And as she desperately reaches out to her boyfriend, who's also being taken away. And I saw an image of a video rather of a young Israeli woman in the back of a Jeep being taken out of the Jeep with her hands tied, put in the back seat of the Jeep, uh, and her pants are bloody around her uh, private parts. And so I wrote to my family. I actually have the, uh, I have the screenshot here. I looked it up. Let's see if I can share it with you. I wrote to my family and said the following. Can everyone see this? Terrible things happening in Israel today. Mass Hamas infiltration of the South, 40 plus killed, unknown number of civilian and soldiers, captives in, Ga captives in Gaza, nothing like this before. I'm trying to make this a bit bigger. Thousands of rockets. 40 minutes later, I wrote, death toll is now over 100 with some 800 injured. It's a real nightmare. Awful videos coming out of civilians, including women, being abducted and taken to Gaza. It's not even clear how these 100 plus people died. Hamas controlling several southern towns and villages. Nightmare situation. And you can see my brother, my older brother, could only respond with two words. And he wrote, my God. Okay. How do I turn off this share here? <laughs> 
Paul's share. Okay. Can you see me now? I'm not very Zoom uh, savvy. Elliot, can you uh, uh, go to... Um... <laughs> Stop share. Got it. All right. So, of course, I was very torn about whether to go through with the wedding. And it was, uh, and, but, but shortly thereafter, I got a message from my friend Nathaniel in Tel Aviv. Uh, he's an American like me who, who made Aliyah. And he wrote me, don't let anything interfere with your simcha. And I thought, he's right. And so we went through with it. It was a lovely ceremony despite everything. Uh, we had a lovely dinner with both of our families. And then we went back to the hotel and uh, slept, of course, caught up on the news and tried to get some sleep. The very next morning, I get a call from my father. Both of my parents are Israeli. My my dad is a, a scientist, an optical physicist. He's not uh, necessarily the most... Uh, I've never seen him cry, shall we say. He's... he's um, He's not the he's not the most emotional uh, man that I know, but I could hear him on the other end, and I could hear his voice was rather weak. And he said, uh, "Have you talked to anyone in Israel?" And I said, "Well, yeah, my my uh, Amir, my cousin, uh, called. I assumed he just wanted to kind of give us some updates about the situation, probably to say Mazaltov." And uh, my dad, I can hear his voice cracking, and he says, "Just one word." He says, "Tomer, Tomer Neherag, Tomer was killed." So Tomer is the son of uh, my cousin, Michal. We're a very small family. I only have three first cousins in the world, two of whom live in Israel. Um, and Tomer was a platoon commander in an elite unit called Sayeret Nachal, the Nachal Reconnaissance Unit. Um, and, um, and he was killed battling the Hamas terrorists very, very early in this attack. They'd been deployed to Kerem Shalom right on the border with Gaza. So I just want to talk a little bit about Tomer and about his family. And in fact, I'll share a photo with you of Tomer as I do. So that's Tomer. Um, he was, I, of course, when anyone... Okay, so so Tomer's family were are kind of the, the old uh, Israel, if you like, sort of the old Israeli left. Um, you know, his father would, uh, would for years, would, would pick up, they live in southern Israel, for years he would pick up sick kids from Gaza, take them to hospital uh, in Israel, and, and take them back. Um, they, they, they were always uh, on the political left, they were always peaceniks, and yet Tomer always wanted to be a warrior from when he was even a little kid. I remember we used to ask his parents, what should we bring him you know, for his birthday or for a holiday? And they would say, oh, bring him a plastic sword, bring him a plastic shield. That's, that's what'll make him happy. He, uh, he, had a, he had a photo in his, in his bedroom of his great grandfather, who was a member of Hashomer, uh, the very first Zionist self-defense organizations. And in this photo, his great grandfather is on, on a horse on his back, on his hind legs. And Tomer would jump up on the bed and, 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 and kiss this photo. Um, so, you know, he was, he was killed doing exact, doing what he always wanted to do, which is, uh, to defend the country, to defend his family. He was not a political person, as far as I could tell. Uh, he was not a militaristic kind of person, uh, but that's what he, what he always wanted to do. And the amount of, sadly, the amount of funerals that were taking place in the days after this attack, and even until now, was so massive that the army simply didn't have the resources to bury Tomer. It took five days and a lot of pushing on the part of my family members to even hold a funeral for Tomer. And while we're on this rather grim subject of, of, of bodies and of body counts, I want to I want to add some historical context here. Uh, and I and I promise this whole talk will not be depressing and grim. I will I will bring some rays of light uh, later on. I I promise. But um, but I do think it's important to look straight in the face of what's what's happened, um, and and to put it in context. So if you look, I'm sure you've heard that this is the bloodiest October seventh was the bloodiest day for Jews since the Holocaust. And of course that's true. 
But it was far and away the bloodiest uh, day in Israeli history with no close competitor. So let's let's look at the second bloodiest day in Israeli history. That was the first day of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Well, as we know, on 10-7, 13 or 1400 Israelis were killed. On the first day of the Yom Kippur War, it was 300 Israelis, all of them soldiers. Whereas, of course, on 10-7, it was overwhelmingly civilians killed in the most brutal ways possible, old people, young people. I don't need to recount all of the things that you've already read. The Second Intifada, if we look at the worst day of the Second Intifada, the bloodiest day of the Second Intifada was 122 people killed. So that's less than a tenth of what happened on October 7th. And the death toll from October 7th was higher than the entire Second Intifada. The entire Second Intifada, which lasted three or five years, depending on, on how you count. And of course, there's the new element of the hostages. Of course, Israel has had its citizens taken hostage before. All of you will recall the Gilad Shalit uh, incident, shall we say, the Gilad Shalit saga. It ended up lasting five years. But Hamas, of course, kidnapped, capt uh, took, abducted, rather, uh, Gilad Shalit, uh, IDF soldier in 2006. And Israel ended up releasing him five years later in exchange for 1,100 terrorists. So now, as you know, we've got 240 hostages in Gaza. The number seems to keep going up. This includes women and children, and babies. So how on earth are we going to get 200 people out of there? Are we going to release 200 thousand terrorists? I don't think so. So that will have to be a lecture for another time because I simply don't have the answer to that question. So, you know, I, I tweeted the other day, I wrote, you know, there's one word that keeps resonating in my in my head when I think about 10-7 and it's nightmare. Nightmare. It's It's hard for me to imagine how things could have gone worse. I actually... You know, I don't think there was a page in the IDF playbook that laid out this scenario. I don't think it was anywhere in there. I think, uh, you know, there were there were scenarios in which Hamas breaches the border, manages to kill a few Israelis and then are eliminated. But the notion that they would pour in in their thousands, run a riot for hours and hours and hours. Civilians defenseless, 200 plus hostages, I genuinely don't think that it was ever considered as a conceivable scenario by the IDF. So I promised uh, rays of light and, and, and here goes. I think despite everything I've just spoken about, we've seen since October 7th, we've seen the beautiful side of Israel. We've seen Israel Hayafa. We've seen the kind of you know, there's that that phrase in Hebrew, Kol Israel arevim all of Israel is responsible for one another. And I think we've really seen that in Israel. We've seen tremendous unity and solidarity. We've seen, uh, without getting too political, I think we've seen a, a government that has not been able to uh, care for its citizens in the aftermath of this attack, let alone, uh, let alone before or during. And, but but in that in that vacuum in that absence we've seen this massive grassroots effort uh, fifteen thousand people in Tel Aviv alone collecting old clothes you know collecting clothes for people who have been uh, left homeless uh, restaurants delivering all of their food to soldiers on the front people finding homes for people who people whose homes are lost or who have been evacuated for their own safety. And it's really, it's really been quite, quite inspiring. Um, and, and, and let's not recall what the country looked like uh, before this attack. Let's not, let's not forget how consumed the country was by this ju judicial overhaul campaign, which really tore, uh, really tore the country in two. There was an ugliness there and, and a rancor among Israelis that I don't remember uh, having seen before. And so, I think when, when we talk about, about unity and, and about solidarity and about making 
the most out of extremely difficult circumstances, it's it's a, it's actually an appropriate tie in uh, to my book. My book is about the first Palestinian Arab uprising, the first Intifada, really, and um, the the kind of what I what I argue in the book is that. Um, the, the the revolt was Arab, of course, it was the great Arab revolt. But the Jewish counter revolt is a is a crucial uh, chapter in the story of how most of Mandate Palestine became the state of Israel. I argue that 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 the Jews, led even at this time by by David Ben Gurion, were were masters. The Jewish Zionist leadership were really expert in turning adversity uh, into advantage, and I'll I'll talk about a bit more about that uh, momentarily. But I just I do want to speak a little bit about how this revolt began and just set set the scene. Uh, you know, oftentimes when I start telling people about my book, they say, oh, you mean uh, Hebron 1929? And the answer is no. Uh, Hebron, the Hebron massacre was a very grim and gruesome uh, series of, of terrorist acts in Hebron and elsewhere over a few days that killed 133 Jews in very brutal ways that recall some of the atrocities we saw three weeks ago. Uh, but I argue that, I believe, and I argue that they were just that. They were terrorism, uh, they were riots, but they were not a sustained nationalist uprising. The first time we saw anything like that, uh, an intifada, as we say today, was 1936. Um, and so how how did the revolt begin? I think it's, it's impossible to kind of uh, to consider this revolt without looking at the demographic uh, backdrop. Um, the, the, in the, of course, Hitler comes to power in January 1933. And then in the first half of the 1930s, the Jewish population of Mandate Palestine, the, the land of Israel, doubles. So uh, in 1935, you have immigration to Palestine that tops uh, 60,000 people. Okay, so 60,000 Jews come to, to Palestine in 1935, and that's double the number from the year before. And it's very clear uh, to the Arabs of Palestine, not just the uh, more westernized intelligentsia of the, of the city or the elites, but it's very clear even to subsistence farmers, many of them illiterate, that if things continue this way, the Jews will be a majority before long. And so in that same year, 1935, there's a man whose name will be known to many of you, uh, and that's uh, Is Adin al Qassam. Of course, this man has lent his name to the Hamas armed wing, the Hamas terror wing that committed the atrocities at 10 7. And Qassam was a, a preacher, a jihadi preacher, originally from Syria. And in the early 20s, he becomes wanted by the French authorities there, and he flees down to Palestine, to Haifa which at this time is, is, is a mixed city, but still an Arab majority city. And he's preaching in, in a mosque there. The mosque still exists. You can, you can visit it. It's called Istiqlal Mosque. Uh, and he's preaching jihad. He's preaching things like, like uh, you know, when the British officer presents his boot for you to, to shine, don't, don't take out your brush, take out your pistol, that, that sort of thing. And his acolytes wage a number of sporadic attacks against British targets and against Jewish targets and Jewish Jewish civilians, I should say. And at a certain point, they kill a Jewish member of the Palestine police by the name of Moshe Rosenfeld. And uh, that was a big mistake because now they've killed a member of the uh, British Mandate's police force. They've, they've, they've uh, killed a, a servant of, of the king and he becomes a wanted man. And a manhunt ensues and Qassam is killed by British forces in the forest of what is now the Northern West Bank. And Qassam really becomes the first Palestinian Arab uh, martyr icon, becomes the first martyr in the Palestinian Arab pantheon. And Ben-Gurion, who's the head of the Jewish agency, and who, as I mentioned, is even in this at this point, the clear leader of, of the Jews of, of, of Palestine, he recognizes the significance uh, immediately. And he writes in his diary, Finally, the Arabs have found a man who's willing to die for an ideal. And he predicted that hundreds or thousands more uh, like him would emerge. And it's only a few months after that, 
that these acolytes of Qassam ambush a Jewish poultry merchant plying his trade on the road between uh, Nablus and Tulkarim, which somewhat sounds like a like it was ripped from the headlines today. Um, but uh, this 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 Jewish merchant and his driver are ambushed on the roads and they're killed, and that's really considered very often considered the opening shots of uh, the Arab revolt. And so the revolt begins in violence, but very soon after, uh, I'm going uh, the, the 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 Arab leadership, and I'm going to mention another name who will be known to most of you. That's Haj Amin al Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. So the Grand Mufti, these these acts of violence occur, and the Grand Mufti sort of rushes to claim his authority over this revolt, his political authority, and he basically tells the British, this revolt will continue and this economic boycott because the Arabs had announced a boycott of the British economy, the British government and the Jewish economy. He said these will continue uh, until our demands are met. The two most important of which are a complete cessation of Jewish immigration and a complete ban on land sales because very many uh, wealthy, prominent Arabs were selling their land to Jews, to the Zionist movement at very inflated prices, even while while they railed against the practice in public. And so this this uh, this revolt, this boycott lasts for six months. And the Arabs of Palestine are very, very proud of this uh, this this boycott. It's um, this this general strike is actually even to this day, one of the longest general strikes anywhere in, in history. And it, it bears fruit because the British send a royal commission uh, acting in the name of the king, the very short reigned King Edward VIII who would shortly after abdicate famously. Uh, and he sends a royal commission uh, to Palestine to examine grievances. And they spend several months in the country and they write a 400 page report, which if any of you have the entire month of uh, November free, I strongly suggest you read. It's actually very readable. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's got style, it's got context, but it's, it's remembered by history for the last 10 or 15 pages in which they famously propose the first two-state solution. They propose partitioning uh, the Holy Land into a Jewish state and an Arab state. And this is, of course, this is the first time that a Jewish state, the notion of a Jewish state, uh, appears on the international agenda. Not a Jewish national home, as promised by the Balfour Declaration, not a canton or an autonomous zone, but a state with everything that that means. That means borders, that means an army, that means uh, control over immigration. Uh, and so the, without giving away too much of the book, because of course then you won't, you won't read it, uh, but um, the, the British make this very dramatic uh, change to their policy. They announce this very dramatic uh, change in their intended policy, but shortly thereafter, uh, they start walking it back. There are some high-level officials in the foreign office. Now, there's a lot of wrangling in this period between the foreign office and the colonial office. And broadly speaking, if I'm if I'm painting with a broad brush, the foreign office, as, as many of you know, was quite a bit more skeptical of the Zionist enterprise than, than the colonial office often was. And um, various high-level officials in the foreign office basically uh, encouraged the government to walk this back. And then um, eventually, Eventually, and I'm skipping ahead about five chapters of my book here. Uh, it leads to the uh, the white paper, the infamous 1939 white paper, which, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as, as, as many of you may know, there was a conference called the British government called uh, a conference in London, the, the St. James's conference. They called the Jews, they called the Arabs, and then ultimately they produced this white paper, which drastically cut Jewish immigration to mandate Palestine. And this is already spring of 1939. So of course, it's a very precarious, critical time for the Jews of Europe. And I mentioned earlier that in 1935, 60,000 Jews came to Palestine. So the white paper stipulated that 75,000 Jews total uh, could come to Palestine over five years. That would be the total number after which any further Jewish immigration would be contingent on Arab consent. And it was clear to everyone, uh, Jew, Arab, and Britain, that that consent would not be forthcoming. Uh, and so this is really the one most, the white paper is really the one most 
uh, sort of undeniable achievement that the Arabs of Palestine gained uh, through this revolt. But I want to go back to this idea of turning adversity into advantage. I just mentioned how the revolt directly led to uh, the British government. This is, of course, the Neville Chamberlain uh, government uh, promoting this or adopting this idea, this proposal of partition. The revolt directly led to these, to the, to the, to to Britain affirming that uh, it supported the creation of uh, a Jewish state, uh, and that this partition plan, even though it was ultimately nixed, this partition plan becomes the template, the ideological template, uh, the template in principle of every subsequent partition plan from the UN's exactly ten years later in 1947 to the various two-state solutions uh, that we hear about today. Uh, so that's politically. Militarily, this is the period in which the Jews become a military force to be reckoned with. This is when the seed a, of a Jewish army is sown. The, the British authorities realized quite quickly, perhaps not quickly enough, but they ultimately realized that they were unable to quell this revolt, particularly at the peak of the revolt in 1938. Uh, this is already the period of the Munich crisis, and the clouds of war are gathering over Europe, and Britain is simply unable to send the necessary manpower from Europe to uh, Palestine, although they do send massive numbers of troops. This is the largest British military deployment between the wars. It's not enough. So what do they do? They ag agree to a uh, long-standing Jewish Zionist plea to arm and train them in large numbers. And that's exactly what happens. They create, the British authorities create something called the Jewish supernumerary police. In Hebrew, they're known as notrim. And in this framework, some 15 to 20,000 uh, Jewish men are trained and armed and often paid by the British mandate authorities. But it's clear to everyone that they're ultimately answerable to the Haganah the mainstream Jewish self-defense force of the time, which let's not forget is technically illegal at this point, but which the British sort of turn a blind eye to as long as they behave themselves. The, the Haganah during this period cling for the most part, not completely, but for the most part uh, to a policy of that we call in Hebrew Havlaga or self-restraint. Basically the idea is we're not going to respond. We're not going to retaliate to Arab attacks. We're going to show the British authorities that we're responsible, that we can be trusted with weapons. And it bears fruit. Um, it bears fruit in a massive way for the Zionists because they're integrated into the British military apparatus. And of course, at this in this period, Britain is still uh, the, the preeminent military power in the world. Uh, and this is also the period of, uh, I'm going to mention one other name which may be known to you, and that's Ord Wingate. Ord Wingate was a uh, very eccentric British officer. He was a Christian fundamentalist. We'd probably call him an evangelical these days. He was a devout uh, Zionist, which set him apart from almost everyone else in the British uh, colonial service in Palestine and, and the British uh, and the top brass of the British army. And, uh, and he was a military genius, and he began something called the Special Night Squads, which was a mixed British-Jewish unit that operated at night and took the fight uh, to the enemy. And really, in doing so, he, he, he essentially created the, uh, the, the first Jewish Special Forces unit, if you like, and really the core of the future IDF leadership. These Special Night Squads included men like Moshe Dayan, and Yigal Alon, who would go on to be the leaders of, of the Israeli army. Uh, and so in every way, economically, getting back to this idea of adversity to advantage, economically, Ben-Gurion saw in the Arab revolt a tremendous lever uh, to, uh, to realize his longstanding objective of creating a self-sufficient Jewish polity a self-sufficient Jewish economy that could house itself, uh, feed itself, employ itself, defend itself without any help from, from the British or from uh, the Arabs. Uh, this is, for example, the period in which Tel Aviv port opens because Jaffa port was, was closed. It was boycotting uh, 
uh, the, the the British and the Jews in solidarity with the revolt. And uh, Ben Gurion petitioned the British to open Tel Aviv port, and they agreed. And I've read his diaries. He's simply euphoric. He talks about it as a second Balfour Declaration. You know, he views it as you know, finally we have an outlet uh, to the world. Uh, settlement. There's not a single settlement that's that's abandoned in this in these three years of revolt. Uh, on the contrary, this is the period of Wall and Tower, in which uh, there was this old Ottoman law that if you put up a structure within 24 hours, if you put it up overnight, it was allowed to stay up. And so the Jews took full advantage of this law and and put up dozens of these Wall and Tower fortresses in strategic parts of the country. And so. Despite the real pain of their revolt, and it was it was real pain. This there were five hundred Jews killed over these three years, and it may be that since October seventh, that number doesn't have quite the same impact as it did uh, three weeks ago. But these are massive numbers. These are this is a death toll that we wouldn't see until the second Intifada, and of course, this is a time when the Jewish population of of the land of Israel is much much smaller. It's perhaps three hundred thousand out of a total population. Of a million, but in all of these ways, uh, the, the the Jews are able to kind of consolidate the 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 springboard, the core of that state that they would ultimately create a decade uh, down the line, and and for the Arabs, it's really a mirror image of that. the 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 revolt to crush Zionism ultimately crushes the Arabs themselves. There's a the initial unity of the revolt. So this is really Hajj Amin's finest hour because ostensibly all of, or almost all of Arab Palestine lines up behind his leadership, you know, rich and poor, Christian and Muslim, um, urban and rural, rival families line up behind his leadership, at least on the surface, for the first six months of the revolt until appeal commission arrives. But as the revolt rages again in its second phase after that, that commission in 37, 38, 39, that initial unity just frays completely, and you see rival families using the cover of this ostensibly uh, nationalistic revolt to settle old scores. And so, you know, the the, the British wage quite a fierce, uh, some would even say brutal counterinsurgency measure, and and to to and and uh, and finally wrestle this revolt to the ground. This is the period in which. Uh, we first see home demolitions on any large scale. Uh, this is the, and, and it was, you know, this is the first, this is the, 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 the time in which we see the, the advent of this idea of administrative detention, namely detaining suspects without any specific charges as part of uh, emergency measures. Uh, collective punishment was simply part of the game, part of the rules. Uh, you know, if a if a bomb was laying on a highway, the, the the British officer would come to the village, take out the the muhtar, the the village headman, and say, "Okay, who did it?" And if he couldn't tell him, then they would start demolishing houses. Uh, some 100 Arabs were hanged during this period, um, uh, and 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 really, a lot of the most controversial methods currently employed by the IDF were first implemented in this period as you know the state of israel inherited very many uh, british laws and in fact the emergency regulations put on the books in this period are still on the books uh, in israel but the british killed thousands of arabs in this the, the in british counterinsurgency killed killed thousands of arabs but the an even greater number of arabs were killed by their fellow arabs in this period there was just a a, a paroxysm just a convulsion of of infighting and, and score settling. Um, so the social fabric is just completely torn. You have the, the elite flees the country. This is another precursor to 1948. Uh, the elite flees to Beirut, Damascus, Cairo. Um, the Arab economy is just completely gutted. Um, massive amounts of weapons are confiscated. Huge amounts of Arab men are put in jail uh, or killed. And so really what I, what I argue in the book is that the, the that in in 1939 when this revolt is finally wrestled to the ground by by the British and by this kind of Arab this this um, yeah this 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 wave of Arab infighting that in many ways this is the precursor to 1948 that in many ways 
the the final showdown, the final reckoning between Jews and Arabs, which is kind of put on hold for the duration of World War II, that final showdown that we see in 47, 48 is really won by one side and lost by another nearly 10 years in advance. And so I, will, I do want to leave a lot of time for Q&A, um, for questions. So I just want to, I think I'll, I'll, I'll close for now with this, with this thought. Um, you know, we can't, we can't bring those people back who were, who were killed on, on, on October 7th. But I think, I think if this pogrom, and I think we have to call it that if this pogrom can lead to the destruction or the significant weakening of this, uh, evil organization that calls itself Hamas, and if, and if it can continue to contribute to the unity and, and the solidarity of of the people of Israel, then I think we'll be able to see some um, some rays of light piercing through this these these very dark clouds, and uh, and I think we'll be able to say um, even more loudly and and proudly those those three words that that many of you know so well, which are Ami uh, Sarel Chai. So I think um, I think on that note, I am very happy to take your questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, and Arnold invited you to ask questions. Before that, maybe you could tell people how they can obtain your book. Yes, happily. Um, we've actually, here in the U.S., believe it or not, Amazon has run out, but in, uh, in, in uh, Amazon UK has a few copies left, and Blackwell's also should have stock. So those would be the best, uh, the best ways to, to get a copy. All right. Right, we're, we're opening up to a Q and A now. I'm sure you have some questions to ask. Um, Don't be shy. This is this is uh, as I mentioned earlier. This is my very uh, my very first UK event. I I have to admit I've been very pleasantly surprised by the reception the book has gotten in the US. Uh, very pleasantly surprised, but very. Uh, I'm very underwhelmed by 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 uh, the, the by the response in the UK. It seems uh, sometimes I I you know I spent a year in the UK at, at Henry Jackson Society as you mentioned, and I thought I had a pretty good sense of pretty good understanding of the UK. But uh, lately, it's occurred to me that perhaps Brits don't 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 like uh, don't like going back into that colonial history uh, uh, too much. But anyway, um, I. Uh, yeah, I I would have thought that British Jews would be <laughs> very keen on this period, but uh, you know the book industry is full of surprises. So I, I do thank all of you for for joining me today. Um, you you said that um, things might improve if basically Hamas is destroyed. That that's the policy of the Israeli government at the moment. But do you think you can actually ideologically destroy an organization? Won't it just spring up again in a different form? Well, on the one hand, yes, I, I, I take your point completely. On the other, I think, you know, that ideology existed in the Gaza Strip even before 2005, uh, before the Israeli pullout. And yet things were relatively calm, uh, relatively in Gaza before the pullout. I'm not suggesting that I'm calling for Israel to reoccupy the Strip, uh, but there are, I, I don't think we have to just come to terms with the fact that uh, Gaza will forever be a, 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 a mini Afghanistan, you know, the Taliban style or ISIS style terror state on Israel's doorstep. I think there are, there are people of goodwill in Gaza. Um, it's very hard to know what Gazans believe there haven't been elections there since 2006 most of the people alive in gaza now uh were not certainly were not alive let alone of of uh of voting age in 2006 uh and so it's very difficult to know i think it's probably too far to say that you know, hamas is holding gaza hostage i think that's a bit of wishful thinking i think there is a, a significant amount of support in gaza for hamas but there's also a significant a uh, contingent of Gazans who are who are who are done with Hamas, who find who who don't don't want to live this way, 
who don't want to sacrifice themselves on the altar of quote unquote resistance. It's very difficult to know what the breakdown is. Um, but um, but I think there's I think at this point, from an Israeli perspective, I think anything short of a very forceful uh, response will not be uh, IDF response will not be accepted by by the Israeli people. That's my sense. Because there's been very little discussion on the exit strategy, and that's been true of a lot of the wars that the West has fought. We saw that with, with Iraq and um, possibly with Vietnam. Um, you can win a war, but if you leave, what do you put in place afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely true. And, you know, in, in many ways, there are only three or four options in terms of how this ends politically. Either Hamas continues in power, perhaps in weakened form, but continues in power, or Israel reoccupies the Strip, or the PA takes over. But does anyone really expect the PA to, to ride into Gaza on, on Israeli tanks? Of course not. And then the fourth option, which I've heard uh, spoken of more in recent days, is the idea that somehow Israel could establish some kind of technocratic uh, government that, that would that would uh, that would rule Gaza. I'm I'm skeptical that that kind of government would have much support. I uh, I hear I hear echoes of the sort of attempts to prop up Salam Fayyad, who was very uh, in the West Bank, who was very popular in the West, but not so much among Palestinians themselves. So I think, you know, I'm sure you I'm sure you read these reports that the Biden administration was quite uh, perturbed by what they thought was a, a, a lack of a political plan. They they had the impression that uh, in their meetings with Israeli officials that there was a military plan, perhaps, but there was no political plan for the day after. And I think that may be the reason that this Gaza invasion was delayed longer than many of us expected. Um, but um, but yeah, that's 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 how I see it. It would it would have to be one of those three or four options. And it may be that the goal, the Israeli objective, is that Hamas will, okay, Hamas will remain there, but in much weakened form. And so they, they can pick up the garbage and they can um, handle the sewage, or but, but, but they won't be threatening Israelis, or at least not remotely as they do now. And it may be that Israel, that the Israeli government just doesn't feel confident enough to say that publicly. They don't think the Israeli public would accept it, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. I see Rosalind has her hand up. Just okay. Rosalind. Oh, I'm probably speaking from Bournemouth. I'm, I'm mute. I'm mute. Good evening. I'm, I'm very concerned that people talk about what happens after this and after that. The last 40 or 50 years, Israel, no, prior prior to probably 20 years ago, Israel thought it only needed might and skill and aptitude to defeat. He'd mm. never thought about psychological warfare. Mm. And for the past 40 or 50 years, several generations, and as they die off, new generations of Arabs, and we can also see on the world in the West of left-wing people, all these people have been indoctrinated. It's going to take three or four generations time to clear the world of these this indoctrination, but it's not going to happen. So getting rid of terrorists and getting rid of people who don't like Israel, I, I'm not sure how it can work. Yes, physically to get rid of people, but then mentally we've got billions of people who have been so indoctrinated with weird propaganda about Jews that... I can't see this situation ever improving, even if you get rid of the people you call Hamas at the moment. And what do you think about that? It's a, it's a very fair point. Um, it's a very fair point. I, the, you know, Israel has shown, or the past few decades have shown, that Israel is also able to make peace with uh, with Arab governments, even of countries that are not necessarily particularly keen on on, or not particularly uh, lovers of Zion. Uh, 
We've seen that in the UAE. We've seen that uh, with with Jordan and Egypt in the past. Um, and you know, before before October seventh, of course, everyone was talking about the big prize, which is Saudi Arabia. And from what I've seen, uh, Saudi officials can have have said that once this is over, Israel and Saudi will go back to the normalization track. So this is not this is highly suboptimal. I think uh, those of us who consider ourselves friends of Israel would like to see uh, Israel make peace with Arab peoples as well and not just governments. Uh, but it's not unthinkable uh, that Israel could could form some kind of agreement with a Palestinian leadership that was willing to engage in diplomacy, even despite that um that hatred that and animosity that antipathy that 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 is all over the palestinian territories um i know it's not the most inspiring answer but um i think a certain amount of real politique always comes into comes into the mix when we're talking about israel and her neighbors right had you known about october the 7th would you have written the book any in, in a different way hmm you know i don't at this moment, I don't think I could have, I don't think I could write the book right now if I had to. I don't think, you know, I tried to write the book in as balanced a way, in as, in, with as balanced a tone as I could. I, I'm I'm a dual citizen of, of the U.S. and Israel uh, and Poland, uh, as it happens, but I'm, I'm Israeli, I'm not Palestinian. I, I recognize that, but I really tried to let all sides make their best case to give the reader that that respect, uh, and and um, and yeah, and even um, and 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 even when I was writing the book, that wasn't easy because again, you've got there 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 are five hundred Jews killed in this revolt. This is not something that it's necessarily easy to just detach oneself from completely. Uh, I I spent a lot of time uh, in the archives and a lot of time with quite grim and gruesome descriptions of of terrorism and um and it's not easy to detach uh, oneself from that i should mention i didn't mention this earlier if we're speaking of terrorism this is also the period it has to be said that uh, jewish terrorism really appears on the landscape for the first time um there's uh, the the i mentioned that the haganah clung to this policy for the most part of self-restraint but there were dissident Zionist uh, militia, particularly the Irgun, uh, Lehi didn't exist yet, particularly the Irgun, which were a more right-wing, uh, militaristic, uh, dissident group that rejected the leadership of, of, of Ben-Gurion and company. And um, their philosophy was much more uh, an eye for an eye. And they believed that uh, we will show that Jewish blood is not to be shed in vain. And if they attack our civilians, we will attack theirs. Um, and the idea was that this would uh, this would deter the Arabs from from further attacks. It didn't really seem to work, but that was the idea. Um, so, again, it was not easy always to keep that dispassion and to keep myself um, trying to be as, as balanced as I could. But I think I think certainly in the immediate aftermath of 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 ten seven, I I've I found it very very difficult to be balanced. I, I I've um, it's been more difficult than in the past to um, to find wellsprings of of sympathy. If I'm completely honest, with uh, suffering in Gaza and the suffering in Gaza is real. I don't think we should discount that. It's very real. And the attack, the attack. Excuse me. I'm speaking like the BBC now. Uh, the uh, the Israeli offensive uh, on the Gaza Strip is a very is 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 like nothing uh, Gaza has seen before. And even if we don't take seriously, if, even if we discount Hamas casualty figures, as we should, because they're coming from Hamas, there's no doubt that this is the most heavy-handed, the most fierce uh, and forceful IDF uh, operation in Gaza that we've seen. So, but I, 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 I must admit that it's, uh, it's been, it's been, um, it's been very, very emotionally taxing, and it's been very difficult to. Um, it's been very difficult to find sympathy for the other side, even though I recognize, um, even though I recognize that, of course, civilians are suffering there, um, that 
th- those those thoughts tend to stay up here more. And uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying this out loud, but I'm I'm trying to 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 make sure I, I don't I don't lose my humanity even in the face of such inhuman acts as as Hamas committed. You mentioned that um, uh, there's much more unity now since uh, October the seventh in Israel. The country has come together in all sorts of ways. Uh, but do you think it's going to hold uh, in the long term? Because the, the most recent opinion polls I've seen have shown, I think, that Likud would get 18 seats, National Unity would get um, 40, and Yeshitid would get about 18. Um, it seems that there's a swing away from the government, which is being held responsible for a lot of what has happened. I think it is being held responsible for a lot of what has happened. Even You've even heard voices from within Netanyahu's Likud camp that have been quite critical of the government's uh, of the government's performance before, during, and since these attacks, um, it's uh, it's it's difficult to say. It's difficult to say that Israel is a very fractured place politically. I think all of those, most of those political fissures have been have been papered over for the moment. Uh, um. But um, there may be papered over isn't the right word, but I, I think there's a genuine feeling of, 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 of unity and solidarity and people aren't judging each other uh, right now by who they voted for, as they did just a few weeks ago. Uh, could it get ugly politically after this? I think it could to an extent, but I really do think that just like this country where I'm sitting right now, just like it changed uh, permanently after 9-11, I think that the Israel that I go back to won't be the same Israel that I left. I think just like we talk about the Yom Kippur War and the debacle of the early days and weeks of the Yom Kippur War, I think we'll be talking about 10-7 for years and decades to come. Mm-hmm. And so I would like to believe that that leads politicians in Israel and the public to uh, to set some of their pettiness aside and to and to realize that we've got bigger problems uh, then who wears a kippah and who doesn't, who who voted for Bibi and who didn't. I would like to believe that's the case. Um, time will tell. I, I believe I saw a hand. Was that Adam? Yeah. Hi, Oren. Um, well, thanks very much uh, for, for giving us an insight. I guess my question to you is probably a hard one. Um, I don't disagree that I think anyone who's um, interested in peace, and, and all Jews do, right, we all believe in that, um, at this minute in time, very hard to think that, right? Um, and I think we have, we support Israel and what they're doing um, and what needs to be done. But I guess let's wind forward um, a little way into if Hamas is wiped out, where do we go with peace? How do we get there? What, what's your intake on that? What, where, a difficult question, I know, but uh, something I guess all Jews think about, right, is, is peace in Israel. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. It is it is very difficult to think about about peace now. I think one of the most heart rending uh, aspects of 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 this whole thing, and there are so many, but one of them has been how many peace activists are among the hostages in Gaza. Many of them in the second half or fourth quarter of their lives. Um, it's 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 very difficult to watch. Um, I think you know there are there are certain proposals that are currently being bandied about. Oh, one 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 possibility for Gaza that I forgot to mention uh, that I was just reading about recently uh, was the option of Mohammed Dahlan coming back to Gaza. Dahlan is a, of course, a, he's a, a PLO guy who had, had um, who had significant disagreements with with Mahmoud Abbas, with Abu Masan, but uh, he's considered by many to be a, a relative moderate, and that's a possible, another possible scenario for how, for who runs Gaza when this is over. But even if there's some kind of solution in that vein, you've still got the problem of the division between the West Bank and Gaza. Even if you bring a man like Dahlan back to, to Gaza, you've still got Mahmoud Abbas in the West Bank, you've still got uh, the succession crisis that awaits us when Mahmoud Abbas dies, because it doesn't seem as if he's named a successor. Uh, 
So I think uh, at, at, at the risk of, of giving you an unsatisfying answer, I think any kind of final status negotiation is not going to happen in the in the near future. I think what Israelis are looking for right now is is something approaching security. Um, and I think um, I think I, I agree with you that the majority of Israelis, a strong majority, want a negotiated solution uh, with the Palestinians. But I I suspect, I fear maybe that uh, that is not in the cards over the next couple of couple of years. Uh, I'm sorry to give you such a bleak response, but <laughs> but no, I thank you. I, I think it's an honest answer, right? Uh, thank you. I, I, Thank you. I think the last elections held in Gaza was it two thousand and six, somewhere around there. Yeah, and, exactly. And and, yeah. and, and um, Hamas um, were victorious then in a, in a, in what what could be considered a democratic vote. Do you think there's any possibility that there could be voting again? And have you any feel of who the people would vote for? Again, it's very it's very difficult to know. It's it's somewhat dispiriting to recall that that Hamas didn't just win in Gaza in two thousand six, but it won across the Palestinian territories. Um, not an overwhelming win, but nonetheless, it won. Um, and I think the most positive spin that we can put on that is that uh, many Palestinians were really very frustrated by the corruption of the Palestinian Authority. I think that's true. I think. Uh, the Palestinian Authority is massively corrupt. In in some ways, it's it's it is more corrupt than Hamas. I think, despite the atrocious and evil things that Hamas does, um, you could argue that the Palestinian Authority is even more uh, is even more corrupt and and misuses its funds even more. Although it's a, that would be a that would be a a tight competition for who which which misuses funds more. Um, so it it it's very difficult to know. It's um, you know, much <laughs> the risk of uh, getting out over my skis, as we say here, the, the Palestinians suffer from a little bit of the same problem that we have here in the U.S., which is a two party system. There are, there are only two choices, both of which often appear to be <laughs> to be quite uh, unappetizing ones. So in the Palestinian Authority, it's a, it's in, in the Palestinian territories. It's a shame, in my view, that you've got two very unpalatable options for Palestinians, namely the namely Hamas and uh, the PA slash the PLO. So I think many in the West would like to see someone like Salam Fayyad come back, who's basically non-political, who's a technocrat who really wants to get things done. We have to see if such a person has any support on the Palestinian street. Um, there, are other, there are other people, you know, there, of course, Marwan Barghouti has been in prison for a very long time. He... Um, has a lot of support on the Palestinian street. And there are some analysts who believe that uh, he has left his terrorist ways in the past. Um, it's difficult to know. It's difficult to know. Uh, caution is usually uh, is usually wise on these things, but um, the Middle East is full of surprises. Do we have any more questions? No. OK. Well, in that case, I'd like to thank Oren Kester for his up-to-the-minute briefing on the current Gaza war conflict and giving a detailed insight to conditions in Israel, in addition to giving us a taster of the content of his book, Palestine 1936. Our next session will be in the Shul Hall on Tuesday the 14th of November at 8.15pm, three days after Remembrance Day, when Lola Fraser of the organisation, British Jews in World War I, we were there too, will be speaking on how we entertained ourselves during the First World War. Details of the current Edgeware program can be found on our website, www.edgewareu.com. Alternatively, you can contact our office, office at edgewareu.com, and ask to be placed on the circulation list for the adult education program. Recorded past sessions are on our Edgeware US YouTube channel, and tonight's session will be uploaded to YouTube very shortly. Thank you for attending tonight.